We are the Center for Advancing Health Outcomes. Research that transforms care, policy, practice, lives. Visit us at advancinghealth.ca. Hello everyone, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us at today's Advancing Health Work in Progress seminar series at St. Paul's Hospital on the unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil people. Today we'll be hearing from Adam Easterbrook, who is located online because he is in Comox doing uh, ethnographic work currently. Dr. Easterbrook is a sociologist and researcher at Advancing Health. His research focuses on using a systems approach to examine healthcare systems, including access and inclusion, staff experiences, and improving care. He's been on the lead, he's been the lead on the qualitative portion of the study and has been supervising the rest of the qualitative research team. Mary Berger is a qualitative sociologist completing her master's in sociology at SFU, as well as a research assistant at Advancing Health. Her research focuses on exploring how interaction with the healthcare system impacts people's identity, especially for those who are from marginalized backgrounds. Mary has worked as a research assistant on the PharmaPay project and has helped conduct interviews and analyze data. Angela Pang is associate director of research for is an associate director of research for policy reporter and is completing her master's of health administration program with UBC. Angela is a research assistant for PharmaPay and is using a portion of the data to complete a capstone project for the health administration program. She's been responsible for conducting interviews and analyzing data. We're so happy to have you here. Looking forward to hearing your presentation. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Today, we are happy to share with you, sorry, PharmaPay, exploring the intersection of practice and payment. So just before we begin, we'd like to do a little bit of land acknowledgement. So we'd like to humbly and gratefully acknowledge that our work has taken place on the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Coast Sales people, in particular, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil We'd also like to take this opportunity to share that there are various places to offer our time, resources, and support to Indigenous communities. Uh, our recommendations here are the Vancouver Aboriginal Health Society, Raven, Indian Residential School Survivor Society, and Urban Native Youth Association. We welcome each of you to look into your communities and find an association that you can help. Uh, we'd also like to take a moment to recognize that PharmaPay is actually a much larger team. So it's a multidisciplinary team. We have members from all different backgrounds, including medicine, pharmaceutical science. We have some economists. Uh, we're all contributing to this project to ensure that it is robust and diverse uh, perspectives are included. And so we just want to take a moment to recognize our larger, wider team. As well, we'd just like to take a moment to recognize that we are a UBC Health Ministry of Health Research Grant Program recipient. So as we get started today, we just wanna give you an outline of where we're going. We're gonna start with our background. We'd like to give you some context as to why we're researching what we're researching, why it's of value and of importance to us. Uh, and so I'll be leading that section. And then Adam will take over to share with you our methodology. So how do we choose to study it? What were our reasons? What are some of the methodologies or frameworks that we put in place as we looked at the data? Uh, then we're gonna go over some preliminary results and Mary is gonna share some insights through our discussion on what those results might mean. So we'll get started. So just setting the stage in the background, what do we already know about the practice of pharmacy? So the first thing that we know is that there's been a large expansion of scope. Previously, pharmacists were mainly responsible for dispensing, any task associated with dispensing. There was some consultation, certainly, so patients could understand what they're doing with their medication, what's the frequency that they take it, at what times a day, but really all that fall, fell under dispensing. And now there's been an expansion where there's clinical services that they have to balance in addition to these dispensing tasks. I'm gonna go over this in a little bit more detail in the next slide, but just for everybody's knowledge, these expanded scope clinical services include things like adaptations, prescribing for minor ailments and contraceptives, things like vaccination and injections. Those are some things that the pharmacists have taken on. And while that's a great thing for everybody in healthcare, there is a little bit of a challenge because there's a lack of compensation. So Ray doesn't know, Pharmacists are salary-based employees, and they're not directly compensated for any of these additional services that they're doing on top of their dispensing tasks. And there's currently no methodology for reimbursing pharmacists for these tasks. And uh, one thing we definitely were exploring a little bit more is this increased burnout. So pharmacists have reported feeling overworked and burnt out, which is connected to the issues of the current payment model. And really to give everybody a, a stronger in-depth understanding of that, we wanted to share the history. So we're gonna start all the way back 
in 2008, so we're going to go back almost 20 years now, we're not quite there yet, but almost, uh, when the BC provincial government enables pharmacists to adapt and renew prescriptions without physician's approval. That was the first expansion of scope. The next one happened in 2009. So the Ministry of Health changed regulations to the Health Professions Act to allow pharmacists to give vaccines during the H1N1 outbreak. This was followed up a year later in 2010. Pharmacists can now provide services related to opioid agonist treatments. Then we see a little two year gap here, but in 2012, the Ministry of Health expanded the list of vaccines that pharmacists can provide to patients. And that was then followed up again this one was an update uh, in 2018. There was an update to the opioid agonist treatment. Uh, now pharmacists could oversee patients that were self-administering injectable hydromorphone. More recently, in 2022, there was an expanded scope initiative where pharmacists can now administer more pharmaceutical agents and adapt existing prescriptions. And of course, the most recent was in 2023. This was where pharmacists can now prescribe and treat up to 21 minor ailments and provide certain contraceptives. And just for anybody who doesn't know, some of these minor ailments include things like urinary tract infections, as well as things like bacterial conjunctivitis. So what does the literature say? Well, there's definitely some evidence from the literature that shows that compensation has not kept up with the changes to pharmacist roles. So for anybody who doesn't know, the dispensing fee is in BC, it's about $10, and it has actually remained the same for over a decade. So if we talk about inflation, and I wanna sidetrack us, but we talk about inflation, it's not a standard, uh, increase that goes with inflation, dispensing fee has absolutely remained flat. And the payment model does not directly compensate pharmacists for doing other expanded services. So a lot of their compensation comes from the dispensing fees, which has stayed at that flat rate. Uh, this has led to some other things. For example, pharmacists being hesitant to take up the expanded scope. I'm gonna skip to the end there where it goes, it's hard to do what you're not being paid for. They are actually taking on more work and they're not being compensated. And because of that, that lack of compensation then becomes a barrier. It it's a barrier for them to take up the expanded scope. It makes it more challenging. And it's certainly for them something that contributes to what we're gonna talk about with a little bit of burnout and overwork. Um, additionally to that, there was poor communication about the initiative rollout. Uh, we'll be happy to share the quote in a moment, but uh, taking the example of COVID vaccines, they got notified the day before. And so that's very hard for them to pick up this expanded scope and, and run with it when they didn't get enough advanced heads up. As well, there's a lack of training, not too harsh on our, our senior pharmacists, but their training from UBC Med, for example, or sorry, UBC Pharmacy uh, is very different. Now that we have the PharmD program, pharmacists are learning to prescribe. They may not have had that training, and for that reason, sometimes it's harder for them to prescribe. They don't have the tools at hand to do that as effectively. And lastly, we have that they're overworked and overburdened. So each new phase of expanded scope has, has added more to pharmacist plates, leading to that increased burnout. And up to date, there's been limited research on how this has changed since 2023's expanded scope initiative, which is where we wanted to explore more. So for us, a few questions came up about the intersection of practice and payment. So because we have that limited understanding of pharmacists' perceptions of their role and how that has been impacted by these expansions of scope, we had a few key questions that we wanted to look at. And they were, what influence do current structures, systems, including payment models, have on pharmacists' perceptions and experiences of their role? What are the points of tension that exist between pharmacists' view of their role and how their role is actually structured? And what impacts do these tensions have on pharmacists' feelings about their role and work experiences? Further to that, how has expanded scope influenced the practice of pharmacy and its place within larger systems? And subsequent to that, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but how do these experiences intersect with factors such as location? So for us, location is whether it's a rural area or an urban area, as well as the pharmacy types. So things like chain versus independent. Based on all these questions, we felt that the qualitative approach would be the best route to go. So to speak a little bit more about that, I'm going to pass to Adam. Thank you, Angela. So yeah, I'll talk a bit more about our methodology now. <clears throat> Next slide. So let's start by talking about recruitment and participants. So our recruitment uh, kind of took a three-pronged approach. We sent faxes to pharmacies across the province uh, and invited them to participate. We put ads in pharmacy association e e newsletters and we engaged in snowball sampling. So as we 
completed our interviews, we would be like, hey, you know, do you know anyone else who might want to participate? If so, here's our information, pass it on. We'd be happy to chat with them. An important part of our approach was having an eligibility survey that all potential interviewees completed. And this survey was really meant to in, in, allow us to have as diverse sample as we could. So the eligibility uh, survey focused on things like pharmacist role. So were they a pharmacy owner? Were they a pharmacist? It focused on characteristics of the pharmacy, so the location, and whether it was independent or a chain pharmacy. And then we also asked about demographics of the, the people themselves. So overall, we ended up interviewing about 33 people. Uh, each, each interview lasted about 90 minutes. Um, we spoke to 27 pharmacists and six owners, and I know Angela will probably dig into this a bit more, but the six owners were really interesting because they spoke first as pharmacists, and they were really clear to let us know that they had worked as pharmacists before they worked at owners, and that, that was a really important part of their journey. Um, so, so keep that in mind uh, when uh, Angela gets back to talking about the results. Um, of the people we spoke to, 18 were from independent pharmacies and 19 were from chain pharmacies, so places like Shoppers Drug Mart or Costco, and then 22 were from urban locations, eight from suburban and nine from, from rural. And then when it comes to the people we spoke to, uh, their average age was 40. I think it ranged from 25 uh, to about 70 years old. Um, 19, or sorry, 17 identified as male and 16 female. Um, 19 were born in Canada, while 14 were born outside of Canada, and then 19 had English as a first language, and 18 had English as a second language. And I should be clear that these, a lot of these numbers don't add up to 33 because people could select multiple categories. So if someone worked in an urban area and they had experience working in a rural area, we might count them twice, or maybe they, they learned two different languages uh, as a first language. So I kind of, before we get into our methodological approach, which is constructive systematic analysis, I wanted to broadly mention a few key kind of aspects of this approach that, that you should understand to, to kind of um, understand the, the next slide, which we'll get into more of the specifics. So under this, this constructive systematic analysis, we engage in recruitment and data analysis concurrently or iteratively. So what that means is as we're doing our interviews, we're also doing our data analysis. And that's really important because it allows us to, to look at our findings and to then go back to our guides and maybe modify them a bit. So maybe something we thought was going to be really important and that people would talk about, they aren't. Well, maybe another idea or concept is really important to people. So we'd want to add more questions so we could further explore that as we continue doing our interviews. And as the process goes on, you might even add questions about the themes that you're finding and what people uh, think about them uh, during the interviews. The second important part is that we use an inductive coding approach, which really means that we work from the data up. So we didn't go in with an a priori coding scheme or theory. Instead, we went from the data up. We allowed the data to kind of guide the codes and categories and ultimately themes that we developed in an effort to stay as true to what people said as possible. And then finally, we use constant comparison or the constant comparative approach. And what this approach does is it, it, it encourages you to constantly be comparing what you're hearing now or what you're experiencing now to what had happened previously. And this should occur throughout the entire process of collecting uh, data, analyzing data, and so on. So what I would do, for example, is, is as I complete an interview, I'm going to want to spend time reflecting on how is what this person said in this interview similar or more importantly different than what I heard before and why might that be? Because the idea is by exploring the differences we hear between people, uh, we're going to get a better understanding of the processes that are influencing them. So again, going back to our approach of using that eligibility survey, the hope would be that by getting a diverse sample, we can hear many diverse uh, perspectives and kind of explore them. So I'm going to try to give you a quick overview of, of this process of, 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 of collecting data using this approach. So first of all, we did our interviews on Zoom. We 
got an audio recording and we also use Zoom uh, to, to create the transcripts. I don't know if anyone here has used Zoom to make transcripts, but they're honestly just terrible. So we had to spend a lot of time uh, going back and listening to the audio and fixing the transcript. So I assure you, we immersed ourselves in the data even more than probably we ever wanted to. Um, next, we developed code, which is really just taking those transcripts and breaking them down and identifying what are the most basic parts or pieces in there and then giving them meaningful labels. We then take those labels and we start to group them together into categories. To be clear, the, the codes and the categories are more organizational. They're kind of getting you ready to do the actual analysis. So these categories we create uh, based on those codes that are grouped together should really focus on higher level concepts. Um, so for example, a, co a category like all the positive experiences that pharmacists <coughs> have is in a great category because there's not a lot of variability in that category. There's not a lot you're going to explore. But a category about influences on pharmacists' perceptions of their role within the larger medical system, that would be a great category because there's going to be a lot of diversity of codes in there, people who have positive experiences and negative experiences and so on. So that's what you really want in that categorization process. Sorry, now you can go, Mary. Um, so the next step is creating themes, and that's more or less where we're at now, is we've created our categories, and what we're doing is we're looking within and between those larger categories we've created, and we're trying to understand why do we see differences? How can we start to understand those differences? So we identify the differences, and we go back to the data and try to understand what processes are leading to those differences, with the ultimate goal of our themes really focusing on larger level processes that, that are kind of uh, pushing forward uh, what we're finding. And then after this, we will define and refine our themes. And then finally, of course, we will, we will produce a report. And just to be clear, we've made this like a little pill conveyor belt, but in reality, this is a very iterative process uh, where, where, where multiple things are happening and, and re-happening at the same time. So before I, I pass it off back to Angela to, to do an amazing job talking about her findings, I wanna talk about a few key assumptions uh, that exist within this methodology, just like there's assumptions that exist, I would say, in all methodologies. So the first assumption, it's in the name, it's constructivism. So constructivism is really this idea that we create reality, we interact with each other, and as we interact with different systems. Put a different way, it's the argument that there isn't this objective reality that exists outside of all of us that we can somehow discover because we're the ones who are creating reality. So that means that those facets of social reality that matter a lot to us, like our roles, our values, our norms, our beliefs, and so on, are something that we create and negotiate and renegotiate as we interact with the world. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because if we want to understand pharmacist perspectives, we're going to want to talk to as many diverse pharmacists to get as many different perspectives as possible. And we're going to want to try to synthesize that into a much richer understanding of their experiences that represents their subjective experiences. This means we're going to want to focus on things like interactions and processes. So put a different way. We want to know what's happening, but equally, if not more importantly, we also want to know how and why it's happening. And this takes us to the second and last assumption, which is holism, or systems theory, uh, some people may call it. Holism is simply the idea that when you're studying any sort of social phenomena, you want to look at the entire system and how that agent exists within an entire system. So you can't reduce people's experiences down to some sort of basic element and then use those basic elements to understand what happened. Instead, you have to understand them as existing with an entire system. So what this means is when we want to understand pharmacist perspectives, we're trying to understand how different levels within this system are influencing them. And this can be individual levels, but it can also be levels to do with the ministry or economic systems or education systems, because all of these are going to have different influences on pharmacist experiences that we can't reduce down. Um, and ultimately, this leads to kind of a, a top down view of causality, 
where the idea is the system kind of creates the structures that define the agents within that system. So a pharmacist may want to change their role. They might want to be seen differently, but if the system doesn't support that, then it's probably not going to happen. So that, that's our quick intro. I think Angela and uh, Mary will, will dig into it a bit more. Thanks, Adam. All right, absolutely. We're going to dig into our results now. I will say, just reminding everybody what I said, we are working on our themes. We are still in the process of creating them and then we're refining them. So these are our preliminary themes. Uh, still a little bit more work to go, but we do want to share with you what we have. So our first uh, nascent theme is that there is tension regarding pharmacists' role in healthcare system. And this really stems from two points. So we're going to cover this in two sub themes. So the first is that they feel like they're healthcare professionals first. And Adam briefly <coughs> talked about it. All the pharmacy owners that we spoke to represented themselves as pharmacists first. That was very important to them that they prioritized sharing that, hi, I'm a pharmacist. It's something that's important to their identity and something that they're very proud of. And pharmacists actually see themselves as members of the healthcare system and they're happy to address the gaps that we have. They recognize that they're often the first place patients go for healthcare advice. So now that they can do more, they're very happy with that. And we really feel that this quote kind of shares this with everybody. I'm gonna preface this with uh, the pharmacists we spoke to are incredibly passionate and dedicated. So I'm gonna try and read it in the same voice that they said it. Uh, I apologize in advance if I don't do it justice. They're so passionate, I hope I can capture that. So I'm just gonna head into it. So uh, my role is to help people in the healthcare. I'm the last person they see after they've been to the hospital, whether that's the emergency room or the doctor's office. And I'm the last person to tell them what they need to do and make sure that they understand what they're going through. I think that role should not be diminished. And I have to be thankful to this pharmacy owner because for us, tension always has its opposing force. And ending on that diminished to me really highlights what we see in that tension is that they feel like they're undervalued in the healthcare system. So they feel like they're the last members of healthcare system. They want to, and they understand that they're meant to alleviate the burden in healthcare, especially when we talk about expanded scope, but they themselves are now burdened. And the fact that there's a lack of acknowledgement and compensation really to them hits home that they're least valued members of the healthcare system. And uh, we have a quote here that showcases that. So I think it's just more and more things that we're expected to do. On top of that, with the doctor shortage, it just comes straight to us. In school, they told us that we were the most accessible healthcare professionals. And they told us like it was something to be proud of, but it's turned into something where it's a curse now. And that's, I think the room can agree is kind of a disappointing thing to hear. They love their position, but they feel like they're undervalued and they feel like they're cursed now. And where does that come from? So that leads us to our second theme, which for us is that there's influence of systemic factors on the role of pharmacist. And a key one that came up, and I wish we had 12 hours to present because we have so many quotes on this, is how pharmacy is a business driven model now. So if we take an example in contrast with physicians, they're paid by fee for service. It's a very different model than what pharmacists experience and that's leading to some of the challenges that they experience. So corporate pharmacies are monopolizing the space and this further puts a wedge between the pharmacists and the healthcare system. The motivations that drive them in their day-to-day -day practice are often coming from a business place as opposed to a healthcare uh, framework. And there's uh, just to, to share, pharmacists often emphasize that they are being pushed with quotas and they're not receiving dispensing fees alienates pharmacists from their work. And that's also not only dispensing fees, but all the expanded services fees. They're not receiving anything extra for everything else they're providing. And we have a quote here to capture that. So for the most part, pharmacists work for corporations. Their idea is that, well, now we want you to do this many med reviews a week and we need to do this many max, all these flu shots and sort of adding all these services. Am I going to be reimbursed for it? The answer is always just basically a flat out no. And so sort of the motivation and reward system just isn't there, right? Um, and this really conveys our second sub theme for this, which is there's a lack of investment into the practice of pharmacy, into the, into the pharmacists themselves. So it's a lack of resources, including the funding, but as well in terms of individuals, there's obviously also a, a pharmacist shortage. And these constrain 
and they predominantly impact the independent pharmacies, but they can also uh, impact the chain pharmacies. Some of the reasons that this might be occurring might be the low dispensing fees, might be fee caps, staffing issues, and lack of training resources, making performing expanded service much more challenging. And a, a beautiful quote we have here is, Pharmacare will only allow $78 per personal health number per day. I have recently had it where I did an injection for someone, and then I did a medication review, and the two were both necessary, but I capped over that fee. So I technically didn't get paid for the services I provided. Like you'd have to either do one thing and then have them drive back or boat back the next day, or you provide the services, which is what we normally do. And you just lose out on the reimbursement. Uh, this kind of shows that pharmacists are having to make decisions, having to use their judgment on how to care for patients. That's almost contrary to the business model that they're set up in. And this leads us to our third theme, which is autonomy over practice. So for pharmacists, they really want to have that say in how their practice is run. And there's definitely a lack of communication. So initiatives are often rolled out. They're rolled out last minute. And pharmacists were not provided adequate training. And one thing that was remarked is that decisions were often made without input from the frontline pharmacists. And we have a quote here that captures that. I feel like it hasn't been communicated well because we get things very last minute. They don't tell us until it's the day of. So we get a notice from BCPHSA and it's like, okay guys, we're gonna start doing the vaccine starting today. You gotta to read all these criteria for eligibility and it's the day before. If you're working then suddenly people come in asking for their shots and you have no idea what's going on. That is one of the components that leads to that tension in the autonomy over practice. But another one is divergent interests. So, the business model has a real big implication here where pharmacists feel that they have limited power over their profession because of those diverging interests. The interest in the business component, the interest in the healthcare. Uh, they also remark that government associates with corporations uh, and pharmaceutical companies and the corporations are all entirely business driven. And this is where the burnout actually goes beyond the workload. It reflects a dissatisfaction that occurs not only because of compensation but a lack of power and of respect that they receive. And uh, I happen to love this quote here. So the BC Pharmacy Association is corporately driven and very corporately influenced. They are not the voice of frontline pharmacists. They are the voice of the corporate entities of pharmacy. So that's the influence, right? BC introduced requirements for owners, but they're not strong enough because if your pharmacist is facing pressure from ownership, there's no consequence. And uh, we didn't wanna forget something that's really impactful and something that we're still refining and working on is that there's a big influence that kind of threads through all of these themes. And so that's our intersection of pharmacy location. So that urban versus rural, as well as chain versus independent. So they really complicate what's already a complex practice here in BC. And uh, I'm just gonna read the quote here because I think this covers it very well. Uh, this was specifically from a pharmacy manager in a rural area. So. I wish there's more support for rural pharmacies because it's definitely challenging rural areas, especially because there's a shortage of pharmacists. The cost of bringing the pharmacists over can be quite expensive for us. We pay for the hotel, we pay for the meal, we pay for the flight, the travel time. I think it would be great if we can get reimbursement for what the pharmacist, pharmacist ownership needs to spend. And then again, we see with the chain and independent that there's those diverging interests, the independents are trying to keep up the chain, that business-driven model is really quite impactful and it's trickling through. And so we see that in this quote here, pharmacy chains, a lot of them have gone publicly traded or have been bought out and are now expected to provide quarterly profit results, which get paid out to shareholders. You can't go backwards when you're in that type of business model. You can't one quarter say, I didn't make enough clinical services, right? And so the pressure on pharmacists is because of board members and shareholders. And to give a little bit more insight in the impacts, I'm gonna pass to Mary. Thank you, Angela. Um, all right, so for the discussion, we're calling it a discussion, but what we're really wanting to do is try to show how we can use the results that Angela just presented and use what Adam outlined with the holistic approach to frame um, what we found with our research. So um, we're gonna be looking at this through an economic system, so like the capitalist system, um, but there are many different ways that you can approach this. We're just using this particular system for um, our discussion. 
<clears throat> so using a holistic approach for this was really insightful because it really highlighted um, how factors beyond payment impacts pharmacist perceptions. It allowed us to examine the bigger picture and the system as a whole that influences pharma pharmacists, not just one component. And of course, payment is an issue, but it's just one level of a system that's going to be impacted by all these other levels. And in turn, payment is going to impact those levels because they're all within this broader economic system. So when we're looking at pharmacist experiences, we can see that the issues that they're raising went beyond payment models. The compensation model is a part of a broader economic system, which means it's going to intersect and interact with different levels, such as the individual level. So just how the pharmacist goes about their day-to-day -day, um, roles and tasks, the pharmacy, the community, the culture that the pharmacy is within. And that's going to all influence and construct how pharmacists perceive their role. And as Adam mentioned, when we look at these levels, it's important to understand that they are all unique and non-reductible. And this but they will still influence each other because they are a part of this broader economic system and that will always tie back to the broader economic system. So to help contextualize this, we can look at some of the things that Angela had mentioned. So burnout, obviously that's something that's like very personal, it's a mental health thing, but then we can also look at it as being part or stemming from the economic system that we're in because a lot of the work that we do focuses on productivity and efficiency over well-being, um, or at the very least, productivity and efficiency are going to be more profit driven. Also feeling underappreciated relates to the alienation that we experience in our labor being in a capitalist economic system. And just as a brief description of alienation from labor, it's a term that originally stems from Marxist theory and suggests that uh, the capitalist system puts a wedge between the worker and the product that they're creating because they do not own the means of production. And it also suggests that people are not going to be creating a whole product. They're only taking part in creating very small aspects of a product. So think of uh, an assembly line, like when you're making a car, you wouldn't work on the whole car, you'd just be working on the engine, motor, that kind of thing. So for pharmacists, they're becoming a small part of the healthcare system, which is becoming <clears throat> more atomized over time and more roles are being divested into different areas. So no one is fully incorporated into the healthcare system. And then this leads to pharmacists talking about how they felt like they were outside of the system because they're not fully integrated. And then the last bit here is just the trust in the organizational supports like the College of Pharmacists and the Ministry of Health. Again, they're more aligned with the corporate entities in the pharmaceutical industry, not as much with the pharmacists because they're prioritizing profit and productivity. So what we can see from a holistic approach is that yes, payment matters, but also feeling appreciated and acknowledged within the healthcare system also matters. But these levels are all gonna be influenced by the larger economic system that they exist within. Um, so this is just sort of a, an example, a thought experiment, if you will. Um, this is not by any means final findings, um, but this is just an example of how we can use those broader um, uh, topics that Angela pointed out about like the independent versus chain and the rural versus urban um, issues and how those come down to influence the individual level experiences of pharmacists, keeping in mind that this is also being contextualized by the broader economic system. So the first thing we may want to look at, especially if we're considering the economic system that we're in, is the impact that increasing rates of corporations monopolizing pharmacy have on the pharmacist role. So as Angela mentioned, more and more pharmacists are turning into corporate pharmacists or pharmacies. And this poses many issues beyond just payment because as the holistic approach or the systems approach will highlight, focusing only on payment as the primary issue negates these larger issues that stem from the economic system. So corporate pharmacies show quite well that they're going to focus on profit above all else, which means profit-driven goals and quotas are going to be more valued in chain stores which contradicts the desire of many pharmacists to provide more time consuming clinical care. The economic system will also impact pharmacies differently depending on their context. So we saw this especially with rural pharmacies that struggle to recruit and retain pharmacists and having universal blanket policies that uh, tend to prioritize urban pharmacies over rural pharmacies were a major barrier. So fee caps was something that came up a lot, especially in rural pharmacies. And although they tend to have slightly higher fee caps, they were often still too low to ensure that patients who are traveling far distances and who are often from marginalized and vulnerable communities were able to get all the care that they needed. 
Her current economic system tends to prioritize urban spaces over rural spaces because most of the population and therefore the profit comes from cities. So creating a system that benefits urban pharmacies are going to work against the needs of rural pharmacies. So these are the two very broad, very overarching levels, but they're ultimately going to come down to influence the individual experience that pharmacists feel about their role. So for example, if we look at autonomy over decision-making, that was a recurrent issue that pharmacists brought up, something that they felt that they didn't really have. And if we take into consideration how the economic system prioritizes profit, it makes sense that pharmacists who want to be a part of the healthcare system will feel a lack of autonomy when their interests diverge from what corporations and the government want pharmacists to do. This was also in the quote that Angela mentioned, where pharmacists explained that they had to focus on making profits over doing other clinical tasks. And we had a few pharmacists mention that when they're working in corporate stores, they often had to do retail-like work, which they said was totally out of line with what they were wanting to do as pharmacists. This can also impact their ability to do clinical services at all, because again, profit-driven goals are going to limit the amount of time that they can spend with patients. And this was also the case in rural pharmacies where they didn't have as much staff or as many resources. So they weren't able to take on as many patients in a day and were often turning away people who often needed that uh, care that was more accessible than going to a hospital or a physician. Um, last, another issue that was discussed was pharmacists feeling unprepared for rollouts, which was associated with not feeling uh, valued within the healthcare system. So again, tying back what Angela mentioned about the vaccine rollout, they often had very little time. Um, they were informed sort of day of. And being not being brought into that decision-making process and not being informed about those changes that were, were being made is reflective of this disconnect between what the goals and values of the pharmacists are with what the goals and values of uh, corporations and government want pharmacy to be, which again, taking in the context of the larger economic model is to be profit driven. So these levels are all very distinct and unique. They all cover very different areas, but what we can see with a holistic approach is that they can't be reduced to just one issue that causes pharmacists to feel unfulfilled in their role or to feel burnt out in their role. Instead, it speaks to how a broader system like an economic system comes to influence all these levels and create and interact with one another to create the perception that pharmacists have of their roles. All right, so that's it for our presentation. Thank you. Um, we'll open it up to questions now. Thank you.